This week on Quadriga, invasion anniversary, Iraq's last decade. It was 10 years ago that the United States and her allies brought down the regime of Saddam Hussein. But instead of ushering in a bright new future, Iraq has been plunged into chaos and uncertainty. Sectarian tension has spilled over into violence, and the country appears as divided as ever. The process of rebuilding has also been painfully slow, and despite Iraq's vast oil and gas reserves, the majority of the country still lives in poverty. Will Iraq ever be able to get back onto its feet? Your host this week, Ali Aslan. Hello and welcome to Quadriga. It's been a decade since the so-called coalition of the willing invaded Iraq and removed Saddam Hussein from power. So today, 10 years later, we want to look at the condition of the country. How has Iraq changed for the better or perhaps the worse? And I will do so together with three experts who've been following events in, in Iraq very closely. Welcome to Robert Reed, who is the bureau chief for the Associated Press in Germany. Previously, he served as the AP's chief editor in Baghdad. Sinan Antun is an Iraqi author and academic. He was born and raised in Baghdad and is now a professor at NYU. Currently, he's a visiting fellow at the American Academy in Berlin. And Michael Ludas is a German writer and journalist who has covered the Middle East for many years. Welcome to you all. Robert Reed, 10 years later, let's look at the facts. The so-called weapons of mass destruction did not exist. 100,000 Iraqis are dead, by a conservative estimate. 4,000 US soldiers have died. The war has cost trillions of dollars. Would you say in hindsight that invading Iraq from a US perspective was a mistake? Well, I'll give the um, <clears throat> more favorable interpretation at first, which is that uh, it takes about a half a century for historians or people to adequately judge the effects of a military campaign. The classic examples have, in American history have to be the Mexican War, which was highly divisive, but which uh, gave the United States, states like California, Texas, New Mexico, um, or the Korean War, which was perceived as a complete disaster uh, when it happened. Eisenhower was elected on a promise of ending the war. Um, now, of course, we look at the situation in the Korean Peninsula and it looks quite different. That said, I think, um, I don't think that the Iraq war will ever be seen as an entirely positive development. There, there's, apart from removing Saddam, there's very little at this point that we can point to as a success out of, out of the, uh, the venture there. Not just the war, it depends on how you define the war. If you're talking about the invasion, that's one thing. But the broader question of American stewardship until American direct involvement ended, um, I think, has been uh, far less than a success. Sinan Antun, Robert Reed seems to suggest that it's uh, too early to say the jury is still out. What would you say? I would disagree because, I mean, it, it's always astonishing to me why even after 10 years, here in the, whether it's here in Germany or in the U.S., we are still unconsciously or consciously looking for any positive effects of the war. I think it's very clear now, and it has been clear for a very long time, that the war is a disaster on all levels, actually, not only from the perspective of U.S. taxpayers, but it's a disaster on all levels. And, uh, but the problem is that we're still using the terminology that's not really clear. So it wasn't stewardship, it was a military occupation. And we still talk, discuss the removal of Saddam Hussein as if that was the actual goal of the war. Um, that wasn't. And, you know, 100,000, we mentioned 100,000 Iraqi civilians killed, but it's much more than that. But we do not mention the dismantling of the Iraqi state. The Iraqi state does not equal the Saddam Hussein regime. The Iraqi state is, is uh, uh, you know, 95 years old. That was completely dismantled. And the crime against the Iraqis is that nothing was built in its place. And not only that, I mean, it's a blunder where we have billions and billions of dollars are missing in the biggest heist in modern history. This is even according to studies commissioned by Congress. So instead of looking for any positive aspect or outcome of the war, we should discuss how is it that, you know, entire populations were led to believe that this would be 
at all a successful uh, adventure, you know. There were voices right before that laid out the case and said that there will not be weapons of mass destruction and that this will destroy the country, this will increase terrorism, and this will end up exactly achieving the opposite uh, goals that of the stated adventure. So. Sinan Antun's assessment of the war much more blunt and clear. Michael Ludas, if we look at the headlines these days, the international focus is very much the, is focused on Syria, on Iran as well. Hardly anyone talks about Iraq. Is Iraq the forgotten country here? Yeah, in a way, I would think so indeed, because neither the Americans nor her allies are really interested in, uh, well, you know, mentioning this topic, this issue of Iraq. It was not really a success story. It's somehow embarrassing. And the Americans have learned their lesson to a certain extent. I mean, the Americans after the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq have understood that it is not really a good idea to dispatch uh, American soldiers in large numbers to invade a country. So what we see now when it comes to American policy make making, it's a more careful approach. It's trying to convince the Europeans to do the work as, is, as we see it now developing in Mali and, and West Africa. It's the Americans giving advice, helping rebels, but not you know, intervening directly. Very much to the detriment of, of what's happening to the Syrians now. We, historically speaking, I would say, of course, it's still, we are talking about 10 years, and our history involves more than just 10 years. But I think Iraq was the beginning of the falling apart of the Middle East. Um, uh, Iraq, as a central state, has ceased to exist. It, is, it has evolved into a tribal association of different clans and, and, and tribes and, and gangs. We have a north, a Kurdish north, which is more or less independent from the rest of the country. And we have a Sunni-Shiite divide in the rest of the country between Arabs. And of course, the Sunni minority in Iraq is very much watching what's happening in Syria. Should the Sunni majority there seize power, this would give another boost to the now suppressed Sunni, Sunni minority in Iraq. In other words, what we can observe in the Middle East is really the intertwining of, of uh, problems and, and policy making that you know, are very difficult to, to detect. You cannot say we invade Iraq, but we don't care about what's happening in the neighborhood. Let us not forget that the big winner of the power vacuum that was created in Iraq after the toppling of Saddam Hussein was Iran. So the, 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 this obsession, this Western obsession with Iran is a direct result of this failed intervention in, in Iraq. Iran is the big winner, and of course, neither the Americans nor the Europeans nor the Israelis want to see that. And we will talk more about the geopolitical implications of this war, but let's take Let's take a step back and look at the historic perspective again for a second. Let's rewind to Robert Reed. 2001, we had the 9-11 attacks, which was part of the reason, if not even the reason, that the U.S. invaded Iraq, no? Well, yes and no. I, you know, I think the, uh, the second Bush administration was looking for an excuse to deal with Saddam Hussein. I think that... Uh, Bush, in his mind, thought that the fact that his father had wisely ended the first Gulf War, the Gulf War of 1990-1991, with Saddam still in power, was, was somehow a blot on the family uh, record. And they were looking for any excuse to deal with Saddam. As far as whether the invasion was to remove Saddam, I will remind you that uh, um, both houses of Congress had approved a regime change act a long time before the the invasion. I think whether there, it was a stated goal, but I think there was certainly an implied goal of the invasion that, that they were going after Saddam. And I mean, Paul Wolfowitz himself more or less said in a lengthy and rambling interview that, um, well, the weapons of mass destruction, we could sell that to the public. It frightens people. You know, they wanted to go in, they wanted to remove that regime, they wanted to shake up the, you know, the political situation in, in the region. Um, but I would never want to say that that war, you know, was a success at all, or that, it, that there are any signs at all now that it was nothing, it was anything but a tragic mistake. I would like to inject one thought, though. When you say that it was the beginning of the destruction of the Middle East, there's another way to look at that too, which is the Middle East had become a stagnant area politically. I left the Middle East in 1986. I came back in, in uh, 1997 after having been in dynamic parts of the world, such as East Asia, and it really surprised me how 
how little had moved in the Middle East. And so, yes, stability, but there was also a stagnation there. Now, war is not the way to change that necessarily, but I think there was a, there was a problem in the region that went beyond the Bush administration. And Sinan Antun, you were born and raised in Baghdad. You've been back and forth ever since. You know the country, you know the city very well. Would you say that life is now, that Iraqis are now better off? Now that before, Saddam Hussein before, is gone. Before answering that, I just want to comment about this whole notion of stagnation. I mean, it's quite problematic. Uh, you know, no, na no region on the earth is, is stagnant in a way. And the Middle East itself, or that part of the world, was uh, quite active. But, you know, the majority of the regimes there, which were dictatorship and still are dictatorships, were supported by the United States and its allies. But despite that, there were always, I mean, in 1991, right after the first Gulf War, which is never discussed in connection with this war as if it's completely separate, nor are the sanctions that destroyed Iraqi social fabric and economy ever destroyed. But in 1991, there was a huge uprising in Iraq where people rose up in 16 of Iraq's 18 provinces, but they were not supported. So this is not an area that is stagnant. Uh, and these re recent, excuse me, revolts in the Arab world have shown us that this notion that there are regions that are stagnant and that need this Western intervention is problematic. All indications now you asked about, uh, uh, you know, a Zogby poll in the United States, a BBC poll, that at least 50% of Iraqis say that life is worse than it was in 2003 and before. And, the, and as I said, this is the f amazing thing about this war and what it has done to Iraq and even to the US, that there is not one aspect or product or result that is positive that you can point to, nothing. So for Iraqis, uh, as we said, at least 100,000 dead, probably 600,000. Uh, you know, suicide bombings, we never had suicide bombings in Iraq. After the US invasion, we have uh, 12,000 suicide bombing that have killed scores of civilians. Basic services have not been restored. I was never a fan of Saddam Hussein's regime, but after 1991, Saddam Hussein uh, managed to fix the electricity within two months. The regime that the U.S. installed in Iraq, most of it are allies of the United States, opposition, exile opposition parties that were groomed by the United States. Uh, by the way, in this whole sectarianism as well, sectarianism is the biggest problem in the country. This sectarian system was designed and put in place by the U.S. It is responsible for it. So Sunni and Shia divides have existed before, but were they political? I don't think so. The deck of cards that the U.S. had to uh, apprehend the 55 or 52 most important and dangerous regime officials, the great majority of them were not Sunnis, we're Shias. That tells us that something has been changed by using, by the U.S. employing this Lebanese-style sectarian quota system in Iraq. It only exacerbated these tensions and turned them into political identities. I grew up in that country. There were tensions, of course, as there exist everywhere. But one's political identity was not defined primarily by one's religion or ethnic background. That's the product of the last 10 and 15 years. So clearly, uh, Sinan Antun is uh, suggesting that life is far worse off, Iraqis are far worse off ever since the US invaded Iraq. It wasn't supposed to be this way. In fact, it was never supposed to last this long. Let's have a quick look. It seemed like a quick and easy victory. After just six weeks of fighting, President Bush announced it was mission accomplished in Iraq. My fellow Americans, major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. But 10 years on, and with Saddam Hussein gone, there still seems no end to the violence and instability in Iraq. Well, Michael Ludas, uh, Saddam Hussein is long gone, but there are a lot of people who are saying that the current Prime Minister, Nouri al Maliki, is just another version of him, that they're basically saying the US has removed one dictator and replaced him with another. Would you agree? Yeah, I think in a way we can look at it. Uh, we can look at it that way. I mean, the basic problem is that military interventions do not 
solve political problems. I mean, you are, of course, able to topple a dictator, but then you create a void. How do you want to fill that void? What new regime, what new government system do you want to put in place? And I think the American pro approach was very much a, uh, how shall I say, a technical one. You know, they were focusing on having elections, of, hang of having a parliament, of having parties. It was an attempt to really export the Western concept of democracy to Iraq. And of course, the Iraqis have no problems with democracy. But when you focus on the institutions rather than on the mindsets and on the question how do you share power between the different ethnic and religious groups in that country, uh, then of course you, you run the risk of, create, of creating a democratic facade and behind this facade you have the sectarianism, you have a brutal rivalry between uh, warlords who are not really willing to share power, but who use this democratic facade to enhance their personal gains and influence and uh, the gain and influence of their own personal group, ethnic group, religious group, whatever. So in other words, um, this experiment in Iraq has failed in a way because the system did not correspond with what people wanted. They, it would have been more important to take care of basic facilities in that country, take care of security, and then as a second step, you, uh, you know, try to go for democratic institutions. But uh, doing it the other way around simply means that you um, create chaos. And this is what happened in Iraq, and there is no easy way out. And Robert Reed, there's no denying that there's political stalemate in Iraq, is there? At the end of the day, it's a dysfunctional government between divided uh, between the Shia, the Sunni, and the Kurds. There's zero trust among the three groups. Zero trust. There, um, the Americans failed to promote the development of real institutions after they destroyed the institutions of, that had already been in place. Um, as a result, political policy is is almost done ad hoc during periods of crisis, and the country lurches from crisis to crisis, punctuated occasionally by, you know, by uh, massive bombings, killings, etc. So, yes, um, it's a total mess. I think part of this. We have to remember what, there's a tendency sometimes to, to, to say the American position, and there is no American position, there are numerous American positions. It's very clear that, that Rumsfeld and the Pentagon never expected to stay in Iraq for nine or ten years. Um, the, the plan was to reduce the American military footprint to 40,000 by the end of 2003, and then to leave more or less a residual force there. Um, this was a pipe dream, a foolish idea. Um, it was an idea that um, uh, I think was born out of the fact that uh, Rumsfeld's goal when he took the, uh, the position of Secretary of Defense was to reorganize um, and streamline the Pentagon bureaucracy. And the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan were, were uh, distractions in, in a sense. Um, I was there in 2003 and four and could see the scrambling going on to try to um, get ahead of events as they cascaded out, out of control for them. But again, I think, um, you know, yes, uh, this is primarily an American responsibility, and, but I think it was largely through a series of sins of omission and failures on their part and that has created a situation now where politics is, is secularized, personalized, lacking institutional control and lacking direction. And yes, we have that today. And Sina Nantun, if we look at the tensions between the three ethnic groups here, do you think that another civil war perhaps is feasible in Iraq? I hope not. And I think that uh, at least in what I read, uh, what is written and what people express in Iraq is that, you know, of course there are politicians and warmongers, but, but a great majority of people whatever political differences they have, they do not want to go back to, to the sectarian civil war because it made life impossible. So I hope not, and I don't think so. So how would you overcome? How do you think uh, the government can overcome the political stalemate that it's currently in? Look, in my, in my opinion and the opinion of a significant number of Iraqi observers, the problem is, is more fundamental in that the entire political infrastructure, if you will, is corrupt. That's what I was trying to say. The constitution has to be rewritten. There should be a new national conversation about how to go forward. Because obviously the political system that is put in place 
is utterly dysfunctional. It has not produced anything except corruption and violence. Iraq, I'm sure you all know, the government is in the top three for most corrupt regimes in the world in the last four years. And Iraqis know that, and it is obscene that in a country that is so rich and has all this excess uh, wealth, uh, none of it is actually reaching the great majority of Iraqis. It is so horrible that a lot of people are not yearning to go back to Saddam's time, but to a time when, even if under a dictatorship, a government that was able to deliver services to its people. And at the end of the day, this is the issue, you know, whether democracy is just a facade, and we forget that democracy is not just elections. This is kind of the American notion that democracy is elections once every four years. Democracy is institutions, and you cannot build all of that when you have a destroyed infrastructure and social fabric. So to understand what happened and why it happened and where to go forward, we need to go back to before 2003 and see what the sanctions did to Iraq, the most severe sanctions in modern history that killed one million civilians and drove three million Iraqis out of Iraq. And not, nothing is mentioned about the three million Iraqis that also became refugees because of this last war. And s some serious hardship that the Iraqis had to go through not only in the past 10 years, but even before, as Sinan Antun suggested. And indeed, Transparency International lists Iraq as the third most corrupt country in the world, despite $100 billion in oil revenues. The overall majority of the public is still poor, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's a very, very difficult situation in Iraq. For, for everyday Iraqis, it's almost not possible to really uh, make ends meet. It is a very difficult situation in, in all respects and of course when we look at the situation as a whole in neighboring uh, Syria with a potential war against Iran being in the making there is not much hope that uh, you know things will ease in the future quite on the contrary what we can observe for different reasons I mean the reasons are different from country to country but what we what we can observe presently is really what I like to call a retribalization of the region we have a falling apart of central states both in Iraq and in Syria and I don't think that the borders that we see now uh, will be the borders of the given countries 10 years from now. There is no guarantee that Iraq will not fall apart, that Syria will not par fall apart, that Jordan will continue to exist. Anything is possible in the region. It depends on several factors, like, for instance, whether or not there will be an attack against, against Iran. What worries me most is really that um, many Western policy makers, not all of them, but quite a few, still have not really understood that by imposing hard sanctions, as was the case in, in Iraq in the 90s, or as is the case now against Iran, you don't really harm the regime, you harm the civilian population, you destroy the middle classes, the very classes you need to rebuild a society after a regime change has taken place. And uh, at the same time, you know, in Iraq, it was the story about non-existing weapons of mass destruction that was officially at least the reason for attacking Iraq. Now it's the... Um, uh, the, 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 the very fear that Iran might one, day for, might one day go for a nuclear bomb. There's no proof for the time being, but still the political mechanism in the background are still functioning. That is sanctions plus military threat. And in the end, what do you do? I mean, as a superpower, what if the Americans find that the Iranians are not cooperative enough? Then we have another mess in the region that might really uh, bring the whole region uh, to, 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 to a boiling point. So in other words, my impression is that American policymakers have not learned from their experience in Iraq and in Afghanistan, apart from the fact that they will never again invade foreign countries um, with ground forces. They will attack through drones or by bombing a country but, or through proxies but not by sending American troops invading a country. But Robert Reed, is that correct that the Americans have not learned? To look at what's happening in Syria, the U.S. is very much hesitant to get involved in, in Syria. Do you think that's a direct implication of the U.S. experience in Iraq? Yeah, I do, and I don't see any evidence that uh, the Obama administration is anxious to get into a war with the Iranians either. I think, um, you know, that there's a... Even in, in Israel... Um, you know, there's considerable opposition to the you know, possibility of a war with Iran. And I think it absolutely has to do with uh, the experience in Iraq. I think um, what our, my colleague is, is saying, in effect, is that, that although the, that lesson has been learned, there's, there's, no other, there's no lesson learned for how to deal short of that with, a, you know, with, with uh, influencing, a, you know, a potentially 
hostile state. Um, sanctions are supposed to be, um, you know, bloodless war, which quite clearly is not. But if it's clear that, that sanctions have failed in many cases, in most cases, um, but war, you know, is the only alternative. There, that can't be. There has to be some other form of engagement. And I think that's what has not yet been learned. Um, but no, I can't see uh, uh, any sign that the Obama administration is anxious to get in, involved militarily in the Middle East. And say, yeah, please. Well, the tragic irony, as many have noted, is that the lesson, at least to, to third world dictators, is that if you, you're safe, if you do have nuclear weapons, mm. Saddam Hussein didn't have nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction, and he's out, and so is Gaddafi, whereas North Korea is still, is still in power. But we have to remember also that, yes, maybe the U.S. is not intervening directly in Syria, but Qatar and Saudi Arabia, which are U.S. allies, are intervening quite heavily and supporting with weapons the rebels and the Free Syrian Army. So that's a very important point to, to remember. Um, and if you look at the broader, because you mentioned uh, Saudi Arabia, you mentioned Qatar, and if you look at Iraq, basically uh, what we are having is the sectarian violence and the sectarian tensions that have now become almost a dominant theme in the wider Middle East, hasn't yes. it? And by the way, not to always go back to that, but um, we need to look at this whole issue of sectarianism in a, in a complex way. Just last week, it emerged in a report done by the Guardian newspaper and BBC that actually a, a notorious general, U.S. general, who had a notorious role in Central and South America in training death squads, death squads, was actually brought into Iraq by Rumsfeld, and he trained the Shiite militias, the pro-government Shiite militias, in their war against the so-called Sunni insurgents with all kinds of torture and all kinds of techniques. So let's not think that it's primarily the problems that are always there, but how they're galvanized by military occupation. And w once again, I have to go back to why do we ever think that military intervention has ever produced a democracy? And why do so? It's not about mistakes, is that actually the intention was never to produce a liberal democracy in Iraq. On the contrary, if we go back to the statements of the neocons and what kind of economic profits it would bring to the United States, this was not the issue. The issue is to turn Iraq into a pliant regime and a country that would open up entirely to Western investment. And by the way, it is, you know, so it's succeeding in northern Iraq where U.S. corporations have the lion's share and where there is a military base that no one ever talks about in northern Iraq. And the problems with the U.S. and the negotiations were about how much leeway the U.S. is given in terms of having its military bases still in Iraq. So let's not forget all of these other issues and be stuck on these ideas of whether democracy was going to, to spread and why it wasn't successful, and think of the other actual geopolitical goals that were behind the war. And indeed, the geopolitical goals and implications do matter quite a bit. Yeah. Michael Luders, you mentioned and you suggested that Iran is the big winner of the Iraq war. But there are other people who are saying, no, quite the contrary. Iran is actually the loser because if Saddam Hussein had still been, would still be in place, they would never crack down as hard on, uh, on Iran as they do now. Would you, would you agree? Well, philosophically speaking, that is correct. But uh, when we look at it in practical terms, I would say when you create a political void in a country like Iraq, which is not just any country, but one of the largest countries in the region, then, of course, this void is just waiting to be filled. And who can fill such a void? Of course, once this uh, Sunni regime, the Sunnis had controlled Iraq since Ottoman times, once this Sunni regime was toppled, it was clear that the Shiite majority in Iraq would also gain political control. Not all Shiites in Iraq are uh, close to the Iranian government, but still there is quite some interconnection between uh, the policymakers on both sides of the borders. And uh, Iran is indeed the big winner of the political turmoil within Iraq. And at the same time, Iran is also strong in Lebanon and Syria. This is why many observers, mainly from, from Sunni countries, they say there is this half moon, this crescent uh, from Iran to, to Lebanon through Iraq and Syria, which, in, which again, you know, uh, was the reason for many Western observers to say we need to do something about this Iranian influence also because Israel feels thre uh, threatened. And uh, so what we can observe, in my view, the historical lesson is simply this. 
It is, of course, possible for a superpower or any strong nation to invade another country, but you do not solve a problem. I mean, maybe you solve one given problem, but you create new ones that are even more dangerous, more complicated than, you want, than the one you originally wanted to solve. In other words, uh, Iraq, Iraq was a brutal dictatorship under Saddam Hussein. No need to, to, to be sad about his, his uh, toppling. But nevertheless, the time, the past 10 years that we have seen was really catastrophe for the country, for the Iraqi citizens. And uh, I think this turmoil is going to continue. The situation is, is not going to calm down because the whole region is in turmoil. Of course, 10 years ago, the Americans could not know that the Arab Revolution would be happening. But the whole region in the Middle East is really like floating sand. And you don't know what policy might be helpful in order to solve this issue. I think there will be more violence, adding to more violence. And in the end, nobody knows what's going to happen. Has America opened Pandora's box in the Middle East, Robert Reed? No, I think they definitely have. Um, you know, at one time around 2010, um, I became, I hate to say optimistic, but somewhat hopeful for Iraq's future, thinking that given the resources, given the talents in the country, if somehow they could, you know, reverse the brain drain, um, uh, they were in a position to be, a, you know, a decisive figure in the region. I mean, you've got a region that, you know, has Iran on one side, Saudi Arabia on the other, and, and Iraq becomes therefore the wild card, the, the Metternich of the Middle East. Um, but what destroyed that, I think, was, was um, the Arab Spring. Um, not the positive parts of the Arab Spring, but the, uh, you know, the, the never-ending conflict in Syria, the, the uh, dislocation in, in Egypt. And I think it's, um, as a result, it would be very difficult at this point for Iraq to, you know, profit by the situation and develop. I, you know, your, your point was well taken about the... Uh, uh, political mess that, that the Americans left behind and the sectarian division. But I felt like I wanted to ask you a question. Do you think reasonably with the current cast of characters um, in place today that it's reasonable to assume that they will, in fact, be able to overcome these problems? Or is this something that's going to have to be solved by the next generation in Iraq? No, that's a good question. First of all, the current cast, who are they? The great majority of them are either, you know, professional politicians from exile parties in the UK and Iran who are either pro-Iranian or pro-US. A lot of them are very shady characters, including, you know, Ahmed Chelebi, who used to be the ally of the United States, who is internationally wanted for bank fraud. That already tells you something. So the entire cast is completely corrupt and inefficient and will take another generation. But going back, why I think it's unreasonable to expect anything good out of Iraq in 2010, because, and I have to always mention this, in 1991, the United States destroyed the infrastructure of Iraq. General Schwarzkopf said, we bombed them back to the pre-industrial age. How can a country that was bombed back to the pre-industrial age in 1991 and then uh, suffered the most severe sanctions in modern history for 12 years and then destroyed again through another war, how can such a country who had lost its middle class and had lost 3 million people of its brightest, how can such a country with such a horrible occupation that dismantles the state and doesn't build new institutions, it would take a very long time for it to, to, to come back on its feet. So what always shocked me throughout, from 2002 all the way until today, is that people would still expect, well, Iraq would come back on its feet. Actually, a lot of us were saying in 2003 that it will not come back on its feet because of the preview. But, but the way the, the situation in Iraq is looked at is 2003 and onwards, as if previous history does not ever matter. And one more issue about this whole idea of stability. So stability from a Western perspective, actually what it used to mean is that you have pliant dictators who do whatever you want them to do. So now we have, and then we, are to, we were told for the longest time, this region will never produce revolts and will never produce democracy for whatever reasons. And then we have all these revolts that completely shocked all the so-called experts.
And now we're calling it, well, you know, it's instability and it's, I don't, of course, it's not going to be pretty. This is how history is made with violence. But you can't have it both ways. So Western, you know, mainstream Western media wants stability in the region, but they also want change. What does stability mean? Stability used to mean pro-Western dictators, which are still in power in places like all of the allies of the United States and the region are actually dictatorships. And let's remember that whenever any uh, people revolted, whether in Tunis, in Tunisia or in Egypt, until the last moments, Western governments were still holding on to that regime. Which should pose the question is, are these Western governments really pro-democracy or they, do they just want pliant dictators? The, the Iraq war, Michael Luders, certainly has caused uh, damage to the credibility and, and reputation of Americans in the Middle East. Uh, do you think that has improved somewhat under President Obama? Well, I think Obama was somebody who was really hailed in the beginning when he delivered his famous speech in Cairo in 2009. I think many Arabs were hopeful that American policies would be changing, that, that America would really reinstate uh, itself as an honest broker. Of course, this unfortunately did not really happen. I mean, uh, there is still a very strong American bias when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian, Israeli-Arab issue. And uh, many Arabs seem to believe that there is goodwill on the part of, uh, of the American president, but uh, the government as such is not really doing much to, to change the course of American policy making uh, in the region. And uh, this is really regretful. I mean, the Americans very much rely on the Gulf states, mainly Saudi Arabia and Qatar, as you have mentioned, in order to do the bloody business in, 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 in Syria. This is what I meant by, by using the expression of proxy war. The Americans are not going to send their own troops. They will rather uh, uh, prefer, they would prefer to see the, the Turks, the Europeans, or the Gulf states to do something militarily in, in, in Syria, but they themselves will refrain. So they have learned their lessons. Uh, the Europeans have not. They are going, uh, this is at least my impression, they are about to make the same mistakes, be it in Syria or in Mali, uh, than the ones the Americans have committed in, in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. So I think we need to um, reset our mindset, the belief that we can intervene militarily, that we can change policies on the ground by installing political regimes that are more favorable towards our Western thinking, it will not work because the world has become more co complex. The Russians are there, the Chinese are there, and they're not willing to, to accept this American dominance any longer. So there are you know, difficult, uh, turbulent times ahead, no doubt. Robert Reid, what, if anything, has America learned from the engagement in Iraq? I think it'll be a long, a long time before um, an American administration launches anything like the conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq. A very long time before they get deeply involved in what they call nation building and in, in social transformation. I don't think, though, that the Americans have come up with an alternative strategy uh, for how to deal with this. I think the proxy strategy will have its limitations. These are other sovereign governments, and you can't order them to go. The Qataris w may do what you want to a limited extent, but they will, you know, th there's no guarantee that they will see the things their, you know, your way either. So I think we're in for a time of, um, of lengthy reflection. And Sinan Anton, let's, uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I do want to take a quick look ahead uh, to the future. Uh, you've painted a pretty grim view of what is happening in Iraq these days. Are you still hopeful at the end of the day? There are many examples of countries who have come out of war, like Germany after World War II, and it's still blossomed. Do you see the same for Iraq? Well, in Germany, there was something called the Marshall Project, which didn't exist for Iraq. I am hopeful because, you know, there is a young generation of Iraqis in their early 20s who are unencumbered by all these other ideological problems. And like other younger men and women in neighboring Arab countries, they want to create their own future. And no matter what the odds are, they will do it. But we can never forget that Iraq is in a very complicated and dangerous spot, surrounded by all these countries that have their own stakes in Iraq. And the 2003 war and the dismantling of the state has made Iraq, unfortunately, an open field for Turkey, for Iran, for Saudi Arabia. But a new generation will have to forge its way forward and will 
build its own future. It will take a very long time because the last 30 years have been very bloody and very destructive, not only by internal powers but by external powers. But you know, pessimism is also sometimes a luxury that some people cannot afford. Pessimism is a luxury, says Sinan Antun. Uh, Michael Udas, what would you say? Are you hopeful about the future of Iraq? Well, things can get much worse. So I am really optimistic that the young generation, as you mentioned, is, is going to really go ahead and, and develop their countries, not only in Iraq, but also neighboring Syria and elsewhere in the region. And uh, Robert Reed, you have covered the Middle East extensively. You were based in Baghdad for six years. You know the country very well. Your gut feeling uh, is, is Iraq going to come out uh, fine in the long run because you seem to take the historic perspective. Depends on how you define long. I don't see it for another 10 years. For, for another 10 I, years? I just, I think the, um, the problems that, are, you know, that they face now are not going to be solved in the short term. And the regional instability factor uh, is a wild card that could well um, impact negatively on that pr process. Sinan Antun, one, one last uh, phrase. Are, are you, if, if you look at your own country, are you, uh, are you hopeful, are you optimistic about what's ahead? I'm a best optimist, to quote a Palestinian novelist. Half pessimistic, half optimistic. Well, in that regard, I think uh, much work lies ahead for Iraq and the Iraqi government. Uh, ten years after the Iraq war, many opinions on whether things have changed for the worse or for the better. I want to thank my guests for sharing their knowledge about this very intricate and complex country. Thank you out there for tuning in and uh, looking forward to seeing you again next week for a new edition of Quadriga.